أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتد يا لولا أن هدانا الله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا قال الله تعالى في القرآن الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر وتؤمنون بالله صدق الله العظيم My respected brother, our leader, our beloved Imam Sheikh Muhammad Alexander, the people of knowledge, the scholars amongst us, our respected custodians of this Masjid al Quds, congregants of this Masjid, visitors to this Masjid, Jamaatul Muslimin, my dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. The verse that I have recited to you was a verse, as I mentioned previously on a recorded speech to this masjid in Ramadan, was a verse that Sayyidina Umar an, recited during one of the pilgrimages that he led. And he recited this verse, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat linnas. You are the best of people, the best of communities, the best of groups of people that Allah has elevated for the benefit of humanity. You enjoin that which is right and you forbid that which is wrong. And you believe in Allah. The people around him who heard him recite this ayah were so excited Despite participating in the Hajj, they came up to Sayyidina Umar and they said to him, how can we be part of this glorious community that Allah has described in this Quran? They did not accept because they said kalima, la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. They did not simply accept that because they were on the Hajj, that they were part of this Ummah. They understood that they needed to earn Membership of this khaira ummah, this best of peoples. And Sayyidina Umar, Radulatla An, responded to them and said, Whoever wants to be part of this glorious ummah, let them fulfill the conditions that Allah sets out in this ayah. What Sayyidina Umar was telling them, enjoin what is right, forbid what is wrong, and truly believe in Allah. It is a composite group of conditions that must be met. It's not just cherry picking one, Aman to Billah, I believe in Allah. It is believing in Allah and then acting in particular ways. The flip side of this ayah is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the last verse of Surah Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that those who don't live up to this ideal, those who depart from this path, Allah will substitute you from, for some other people and they will not be like you. Meaning that Allah always holds the prerogative of substituting those that Allah may have favored to be the best. Allah will find other people to replace them when they deviate from being the best, when they take the conditions for being part of the khaira ummah for granted. And therefore, the ummah and its leadership is always required to work on this membership and this belonging to the best of people. And therefore today, what I wanted to do in this talk that I do with you today, inshallah, is to hold up this test 
about what is the state of the ummah today. Are we in a state of good health? Are we in a state of decay and decline? Are we in deep trouble? Or are we perfect? Or are we close to perfect? Are we as a collective global community living up to the conditions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets out for us in that ayah? But I want to start with events just over a hundred years ago in the year 1916 with the Sykes-Picot redrawing of the map of the Muslim world. That was the territorial strategy whereby they would occasion the rapid breakup of the Ottoman Empire. They would draw new national boundaries and they would divide the countries of the Muslim world into the French sphere of influence and into the British sphere of influence. Those are by and large the borders that we have inherited and that we sit with almost a hundred years later. But, as I've mentioned before, vultures can only feed on animals that are already wounded. Vultures never go for the healthiest sheep, the healthiest goat, the healthiest deer. The nature of vultures is that they look at those who have deviated from the tribe. Those who are already injured either by virtue of what the herd has done to you or what you have done to yourself. Then vultures pouch. You don't blame a vulture for eating the kind of food that vultures eat dead meat, or injured animals. You ask the question, how did the animal get injured to be eaten by the vulture? And so, we were already an Ottoman Empire divided, not keeping up with progress, imitating rather than being at the cutting edge of change ourselves, not only in theological terms, but also in sociological terms and political terms and economic terms. So we were ripe for the picking. The territorial strategy, the strategy of feeding of the internal decline was now then complemented by a political strategy of how to dominate the Muslim world that had shown its riches in terms of oil to the global world. And it was under these conditions that Samuel Huntington became the most articulate voice for the political strategy for the Muslim world. In his notion of the politics of order, Huntington says, and I quote, the most important political distinction among countries concerns not their form of government, meaning whether they are democratic, whether they are inclusive, whether they are economically developed, whether they are um, based on human rights or other rights, whether they live good lives and decent and dignified lives for their people. He says that's not the most important distinction. The most important distinction, he says, is the degree of government. How strong is the government? Can the government control its people? And he said, you only need a few institutions, the military, the bureaucracy, and we will even allow one-party states, monarchs, or dictators, any form of government that can keep order. This is not an analysis of what was said. This is what was said. He says further, this may not allow or provide for liberty, but it does provide for authority. If we don't understand how this DNA was implanted in the Muslim world, we will forever be complaining, we will forever be blaming, but we will never be moving out 
of that kind of situation that we find ourselves in. And therefore, we need to look at the resultant conflicts that engulfs the Muslim world and the Ummah today. We had this heroic hope in 2011, the so-called Arab Spring or the Arab uprisings. Our hearts gave an excited beat when the people in Tahrir Square in Egypt, when the people of Tunisia, where the king of Morocco had to yield to some reforms, when the people of Libya rose and the people of Syria began to speak out and the eastern provinces of Saudi Arabia rang with the bells of freedom and Iraq was trying to get out of the occupation and Yemen got rid of Ali Abdullah Saleh and so forth. There was suddenly a hope that maybe this is the moment when the Ummah could refine itself again, could purify itself again, could return to a path of goodness and of righteousness for its people again. But we all know that that was a short-lived hope as the counter-revolutions came, as the pharaohs returned, as the good people were jailed and executed and trumped up charges, and where there was the bells of liberty, suddenly there was the bells of repression knocking down these uprisings that happened all over the world. People who were once in government were now in jail. People who were once in government were now in exile. People who brought in freedom were now the hunted people across the world. And that is what we have to say. And again, it is easier to say that the military did this, the Americans did that, and they all have their fingerprints over the counter-revolution. But we must also ask the question, what did we do wrong? What should we have done better? Were we true custodians of a vision? Did we read the political situation in the world, or did we think that freedom was going to be permanent, and therefore did not make provision for this counter-revolution that would come? So we must always have one eye on the external and one eye on the internal. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised us, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat min nas. Um, not that one. Um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah does not change the condition of a people. Kuntum khayra um, in Allah la yughayru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayru ma bi anfusihim. Allah does not change the condition of a people until they change that which is within themselves. No change will come from outside. It has to start inside. There could be outside help. But unless you do the reflection internally, you will not be able to make the permanent degree of change that is often required. We see this continuous restlessness across the Muslim world. Today, we look at the uprisings that we have seen in some places in Iran. And so often, we can again look at who's manipulating, and there may be manipulation, the way Trump jumped on it, the way Israel jumped on it, says that there were these feelings. The same thing in Turkey. The way the Americans and the Israelis jumped on those uprisings, the glee with which they did it, says that they do want regime change. But again, you cannot fail to create a million jobs a year and hope that people will be happy. You cannot suddenly ban social media and hope that people will just accept it as such. You cannot have a budget that, doesn't, that starts cutting the services of people and the price of egg, eggs multiply and bread comes out of reach of the costs of ordinary people. And again, we must say, what are the external manipulations and what are the internal conditions that make us pray for the vultures? The last month has been a difficult month for the Palestinians as if the last 60, 70 years have not been difficult by itself. Every time you think we have reached the height of suffering, the height of persecution, the height of occupation, it just appears as if there's more room for intensifying persecution, intensifying suffering. Up till two months ago, Hamas and Fatah were arguing 
between whether they want a single Palestinian state or a two-state solution with Israel and Palestine living side by side. All of us who love Palestine were engaged in those same debates. Some taking Hamas aside, some taking Fatah aside, some being idealistic and wanting a single Palestinian state, some being pragmatic and saying, let's compromise with two states. Today, Hamas and Fatah are coming together to discuss how to prevent a single state, but a single Israeli state. You see, brothers and sisters, these are the micro changes and the macro changes that happen when the Ummah does not put its head together to read the conditions in the world, when the Ummah does not understand how a maverick in America can change the calculus on the ground, when the forces of the Palestinians think that they have the luxury to be divided all the time, it takes a Trump and a Netanyahu to push them together to defend even a two-state solution against the onslaught of a one state with Jerusalem as the undivided capital, not of Palestine, but of Israel. And so these are the conditions under which we find ourselves. In Yemen, King Mohammed bin Salman, or Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, he said that the war would be over in three weeks. The war is going on for three years now. The Houthis are not giving an inch and in fact are building up their capabilities. The one area that may appear as if the world may be in an easier space is the territorial defeat of Daesh, of ISIS in Iraq and Syria. But what they lose in territory they may gain in forward bases across the world with 40 nodes from which to attack in random ways. We may sometimes wish that they were confined to Raqqa so that we knew where they were and we could watch them. They may now be a danger in the name of Islam and in the name of Muslims, they may now be a danger to many, many more people. Of 21 million refugees, we probably have 70% of the refugee community. Muslims are either being displaced or they are voting with their feet and saying we don't want to be under the territory of Dola Islamia, of the territory of Islam. We need to be out of here. We're going to Germany. We're going to Scandinavia. We're going to America. We're going to South Africa looking for other places in which to live. And so... We need to understand, my dear brothers and sisters, how it is that we are having to sit with an ummah that is deeply fragmented, fractured, in some cases broken. Most of the failed states in the world are those with the majority of Muslims. The rest of us are either authoritarian or fragile. But very few of us are developed coherent and cohesive states. What we must understand in the Muslim world is that there are two geopolitical blocks standing up against each other. On the one, led by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, bringing in the UAE, bringing in Egypt, bringing in other countries that have experienced the Arab uprisings and the Arab Spring, and they now have been pushed back and dictators have taken their turn again. It is disturbing when you hear an Israeli cabinet minister, Yuval Steinitz, speak about the growing covert relationship between Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. It is also worrisome that the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia speaks about how Israel is no longer an enemy. Something is happening that I think we need to understand before we jump onto the bandwagons that they prepare for us. When they do that, coming together on, amongst those states, backed by the USA, they want us to enter their war by saying that the enemies 
not Iran, but the enemy are Shias. I'm not saying we don't have theological differences with Shias. We've had them for centuries, but we've managed them. But let me put one test to you, my dear brothers and sisters. If indeed the battle is theological or religious on the one hand, or whether the battle is geopolitical on the other hand. I have said to myself that I will not believe that the enemy is Shia unless and until there are no more visas for Shias to perform Hajj and Umrah. Because if the test of who can enter the holy grounds of Mecca is belief in Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, if that is the condition for entry, then how can you give it to those that you let us believe are non-Muslim? Until that happens, reserve your judgment and call it a geopolitical battle between a group led by Saudi Arabia and a group led by Iran with backers in the West and backers in Russia, on the other hand. Treat everything as geopolitical and don't be seduced into thinking that we are dealing with a theological or a religious battle. And I put to you, my dear brothers and sisters, the notion in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also describes for us the idea of what will further increase our decline if it has not caused our decline already. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us in Surah Al-Anfal, وَأَتِيُوا اللَّهَ وَرَسُولُ Obey Allah and obey the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا And fall not into disputes amongst yourselves. فَتَفْشَلُوا Because then you will lose courage. وَتَذْهَبَ رِيخُكُمْ And your power will depart from you. وَصْبِرْ وَصْبِرُوا And be patient. Endure it. Be resilient with what happens to you. In Allah Sabirin. Allah is with those who are resilient and patient and enduring. When this trouble hits the Ummah as it has hit us in the contemporary world today, return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Follow them. and resist being pulled into disputes amongst ourselves. Because Allah knows that when your power has departed from you, the little power you have, you will use amongst each other and against each other. You can't defeat America, so let's try and make a war against Iran. You can't defeat Israel, so let's get President Hariri to resign and cause a chaos in Lebanon so that there can be civil war there. We can't fight against European imperialism, so let's go and fight the Houthis and call them Shias and get the whole Muslim world behind us on that basis. Our understanding and our navigation of the current state of the Ummah depends on retaining our sanity based on belief in Allah, following the Prophet wasallam, not falling into disputes and not being pulled into disputes amongst ourselves, why would the Ummah, which is 1,6 billion people, decide that 15% don't belong to us anymore? That 30% who follow some or other Sufi tariqah, that they are guilty of, of shirk, and they are guilty of bid'ah, and they are guilty of kufr. Why would we cut up the Ummah further when we should be doing everything to unite us into one block that can resist this current state of weakness that we find ourselves in? And so we need, my dear brothers and sisters, to, to really understand how it is that we can pull ourselves back from the brink. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in my last minute, has shown us before, and I remind you of this, 
There was a time in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam and the early Sahaba, may Allah be pleased with all of them, when the persecution against the Meccan Muslims was so severe, we had just seen the martyrdom of Sumayya, may Allah be pleased with her, the torture of Sayyidina Bilal, may Allah be pleased with him. We had just seen the humiliation of the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam, people throwing dirt on him. We had seen the boycott for two years of the early Muslim community. No one sold food or bought anything from them. The richest man in Mecca, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, became one of the poorest people for his belief in Islam. And then suddenly, one day, there was the equivalent of breaking news. The Prophet gets this revelation almost as it happens, a short distance away, and Allah says, Holy but your room. Rome has been vanquished. And Allah says, in a place not far from here, at this kind of moment. And Allah says, but soon, with Allah's help, they will be victorious again. And Allah says, And Allah says, and on that day when they are victorious, happy, satisfied, will be the believers. What Allah announces is that the two superpowers of the time, Rome and Persia, had fought each other to a standstill. That Allah says that in this period, a few years, this will be the period when there will not be a war. Because they are back in their barracks, retooling their armies, replenishing their coffers. Allah subhanahu wa goes on and says that you will be happy on the day that they come out to fight each other again. But it wasn't a time for complacency. This was the time as respected brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ used this time, firstly, to explore alliances outside of Makkah. He tries Ta'if, it doesn't work. But then Aus and Khazraj, the two tribes from Medina come to him to resolve a dispute. What does he do? He wins their trust. And then he unites them. And suddenly they are no longer Aus and Khazraj. They are now the Ansar, the helpers. They are the ones who will help the Muslims of Makkah. He didn't go and divide them. He went and said, let me resolve your differences amongst you. He then, once he had done that, and they prepared the way, he did the strategic retreat from Makkah to Medina, which we call the Hijrah. They were then able to move the Muslims out. But before that, he had taken a strategic insurance policy by sending Jafar, may Allah be pleased with him, with a group of Muslims to Abyssinia, to Africa, just in case things didn't work out for the Muslims. Once he had his insurance in place, once he had his alliance in place, once he then did the retreat, the, the hijrah, he then went there and did the charter of Medina. He then first united the Muslims of Medina with the Muslims of Makkah. The Ansar were the Muhajirun, the immigrants, and they all became Muslim. Then he did the charter of Medina in which he invited the Jews, he invited even the Mushriks, and he even included the Munafiks, the hypocrites, as long as they abided by the charter of Medina, because he understood that Islam spreads in conditions of peace and trust, that when there is war, fear engulfs the heart, but when there is peace, there is the possibility for faith and trust to take over the heart. He used those seven years, respected brothers and sisters, when the two superpowers were neutralized to recast the Ummah, to reimagine the Ummah, to build its alliances and to strengthen it from within. Wallahi, two years later, two years after the Hijrah, two years later, Rome defeats Persia. That same year, the Quraysh sends an army of over a thousand soldiers to meet an army of about a hundred soldiers of Muslims at Badr. 
the Muslim small force vanquishes the Quraysh and Islam is unstoppable from that point. I take you back to Surah to Rum for you to understand what the recipe is that Allah presents the early Muslims for thinking their way out of trouble, for strategizing their way out of trouble, for talking their way out of trouble, for making alliances to get out of trouble, for uniting the Ummah to get out of trouble, for planning for the expansion of Islam. And we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us in this moment of great difficulty when the Ummah is besieged from within and from without. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us and give us the yaqeen and the resolve to understand what, who are the true enemies of Islam and who are the false enemies of Islam. That Allah strengthens our heart, that we should not be seduced into making Muslims non-Muslim and non-Muslims Muslim. That Allah gives us the clarity in order to understand what it is that we need to do in this time. That Allah gives us the leadership to help us navigate through this moment of crisis and weakness in the Ummah. That Allah strengthens this Ummah, inshallah. That Allah raises up again as a civilization so that the world can benefit from the great glory of the glorious days of Islam when we were the intellectual trendsetters and we were the theological broad thinkers. May Allah save us from narrowness. May Allah save us from labeling. May Allah save us from um, the intellectual words of tyranny that we use so wildly, which have a place, but which should not be used uninformedly, the words of kufr, of shirk, and of bid'ah, so that we don't use it as bullets against each other, but we use it as always methods to purify Islam, to purify the deen, to purify the ummah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us on this day, and may this be a good year for the ummah, inshallah, and may the ummah recover from its weakness and find the leadership it deserves. Wa akhiru da'wana, and alhamdulillah. Allahi Rabbil Alameen.